into Ruth chapter 1 and verse 19, this little section through to verse 22, it's a very short, simple text, and so I've got three simple headings. And number one is poverty. Naomi left Bethlehem with her husband and her two sons. She was in a great place in life. Culturally, socially, she's got the protection of a husband who's going to look after her. She's got the promise of a future with two boys. But all of that was lost in Mara. And now she returns to Bethlehem and she's a widow. Now widows were incredibly vulnerable. Even in Israel where they had some protection. There's no steady source of income for a widow. No obvious way to work. Life was going to be a huge struggle for Naomi. But it's worse than that because if there's one thing worse than a widow, it's two widows. Twice the mouths to feed, twice the lives to support, twice the vulnerability. And here's Naomi with her daughter-in-law, widow Ruth. When I was baptised, an elder at our church took me aside pretty quickly afterwards and said, you've made a stand for God today. The devil's not going to like that. So you be ready. On Wednesday night, Bill shared with us about how he came to saving faith in the Lord Jesus. And two or three of you straight away said, well, you watch out. Because we've got an adversary. He's an enemy of our souls. And he, he hates it when we stand for the Lord Jesus. Now, not every new Christian faces immediate, really hard trials, but many do. And, and there are people we've just prayed for, and others among you have recently become Christians. And, and maybe you, you can associate with that. You're the only Christian in your family. And you're afraid that standing for Jesus might push them away. Speaking for Jesus will turn them away from you. Perhaps you're the only Christian at work and you know that the, the boss openly mocks faith in God. You, you feel like you're kind of surrounded in, in enemy, enemy territory by those who would only be too happy to hamstring your efforts to follow Jesus. It's, it's a very vulnerable position and you feel like you've got nothing. Can you imagine how hard it was for Ruth? It's a brand new believer coming to Israel. And she's lost her young husband. Her sister's gone back to Moab. And the only person left in her life is Naomi. This is a, a woman with a spider web thin strand of faith. And even that is, is trembling as she looks at her circumstances and wonders, what kind of God have I signed up to follow? What kind of God is this God that I've just said I'm going to make my God and I'm going to love who lets his people suffer like this? How's Ruth's faith going to survive? You know, I've wondered that sometimes. I've spoken at a camp. And one of the campers professes faith in the Lord Jesus. And unbelievingly, the first thing that pops into my head is, yeah, but how long is that going to last? The little girl at Waihola who goes home to two lesbian mums. The boy with the solo dad who's more interested in video games and drugs than him. The, the two boys who have a, a great time at Camp Columba and are excited for the first time in their lives to read their Bible and full of enthusiasm and make a profession of faith and then they have to go back to the, the youth home that they've been abandoned in where they're bullied and picked on already that long before they make a profession of faith or you think of people who've come here think of Keanu, don't we? and we're so excited too to see him showing signs of interest and faith, and then he has to go back to Okanoni and no Christian family or support, no church family to, to help and encourage. Aren't these people just going to be shallow ground, the seed sown on shallow ground that springs up? But there's no root, no opportunity for them to, to hold on. And then we look at Ruth. This widow and a, and a total stranger in a new land with new customs and new traditions with a, a mother-in-law who's full of bitterness and resentment and frustration. 
think, well, isn't the, the faith that excited us in verse 16 and 17? Isn't that just going to be very quickly smothered by the trials that she's facing? And the amazing answer is no. Ruth is going to persevere. Ruth is going to continue following and loving God. And the reason that Ruth is going to persevere is because perseverance, keeping on in the faith, is less about the faithfulness of the person and all about the faithfulness of God. See, remaining in, in God's flock is not dependent on being a good sheep, but having the good shepherd. God is the one who sustains. He's the one who helps. He will protect, and he will persevere and preserve Ruth, even though she's this vulnerable baby believer, and he will keep her secure, and he'll defend her from the works of the devil. And all of that is no challenge to him. He will keep her, and he can keep you too. Nice and simple, greatly encouraging. That's point one. And now I'm going to take this off because it's annoying at the best of times, and when it's not working, and this is the one that I'm speaking to, I don't need to have it around my ears anymore. Point number two bitterness. Looking now at verse 19 and, and 21, or 19 through to 21. <coughs> Otherwise, I'm going to start flinging around when I move my arms around like I do. Unbelievable. Okay, 19 to 21, and we're thinking about bitterness. There's this, this buzz about the place, about the town of Bethlehem, because Naomi, Naomi is returning. And you remember, the name Naomi means sweetness. It means pleasantness. So perhaps this is a neighbor who everybody had missed. This is somebody that they, they remembered fondly. But as the two widows enter the town, people are asking genuine question, verse 19. Is this Naomi? Is that her? And so so we, we ask, maybe it's ten years in Moab, ten years of hard times and stress and challenge and loss. Has that taken its toll on Naomi? An old friend of mine talks about a pair of twins that he knows, and they were born only minutes apart, but one of them looks ten years older than the other because of all the stresses he's endured as a pastor. Naomi hears the whispers going around the town. Is that Naomi? And she jumps in with her reply. Don't take these next two verses as kind of a one-off speech that she makes to Bethlehem. Don't call me Naomi. She doesn't stand up beside the well and preach to everybody, but more we're being given a summary of the things that were on her lips as she returned to this town. This is a summation of Naomi's words as she spoke to her neighbours and as people greeted her. And so this is what, what's been in her heart as she's walked back from Moab. These are the feelings that have been stirring in here and now come out of her mouth. This is what she's planned in her mind to say to people when she comes back to town. Don't call me pleasant anymore. Call me bitter. Because God has dealt very bitterly with me. Now some commentators argue that Naomi isn't saying that she is bitter, only that God has dealt bitterly with her. But that's quite a stretch. I think it's an unrealistic stretch, especially what we've already said about this book and the importance of names to Israelite people. Remember when we talked about the names at the beginning of the book, we said that names were given at birth uh, to, to either, as either an indication of a hope for the future. And so we thought about David naming his son Solomon from the root word peace because his kingdom had been in a time of war and he hoped that his son would reign over a, a time of peace and so it's a hope for the future. Or they were given as a reflection of that child's character or image of birth. And so the classic example is Esau, meaning red, because he comes out red. Or Perez, who broke out at birth, and the name Perez meaning broke out. And now Naomi comes back to new life, or renews her life in Bethlehem. And she says, this time, don't call me Naomi. In this new life, call me bitter. So we can't 
can't escape the fact that, that Naomi, because of her circumstances, has become a very sad and very frustrated lady. But bitterness is incredibly dangerous. And the Bible warns us plainly to kill bitterness wherever we find it. Ephesians 4.31 Let all bitterness and wrath and anger it puts it in that same category. Just a little bitterness, just that, that kind of sad, aggressive, annoyed feeling that we get. The anxiety that we feel over how somebody's treated us in the past. It's in there with wrath and anger. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Bitterness is so dangerous. And I want to show you its danger in four ways. See, bitterness does four things. Number one. Bitterness forces you to carry burdens that you don't have to carry. It forces you to carry unnecessary burdens. There were two knights and they were out on a quest. And they were walking along this river where they came to a, a washed out bridge. And a lady with a couple of heavy bags. Uh, and she was, she was saying, I can't get home, can you help me? Now because of the order that they belonged to, they couldn't refuse help <coughs> to anybody who asked. And so they said, I suppose we will. And, and so they took off their armor and they hoisted this lady up onto their shoulders and they waded through the river, put her down on the other side and then waded back, put their armor on and began walking. Now after about 20 minutes walking, one of the knights said, ah, this is ridiculous, I'm soaking wet, I'm cold, my, my clothes are rubbing under my armor and my back's aching from that silly old lady stuck on this side of the river. And the older knight just looked at the younger guy and just smiled, nodded his head and carried on walking. Another 20 minutes pass, and the young man says, that's it, I'm not going any further, my back hurts, my clothes are wet, I stink of river. The older knight looked at him and said, my back was hurting too. It's much older than yours. But you know why it doesn't hurt me anymore? Well, it's because I've put that lady down on the other side of the river, and you've been carrying her with you all this way. When we're tempted to complain, We've always got a choice. And when we dwell on our troubles, when we allow our hearts to become entangled in them until they're consumed by our troubles, it's a weight on us. It's oppressive. And so we can do that, or we can leave them in the past and walk away. Even though that sometimes costs us, even though it seems so sweet sometimes to have a gripe and a complaint, even though we might have done nothing wrong and we have every right to moan. We can't walk away. Naomi hasn't done that. Verse 21, she's ruminating, munching around in her mind what's happened, feeling sorry for herself. God has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full. Who's compelling her to think like that? Who's making her spend all of her time wishing that none of this had happened? Nobody was. A burden Naomi didn't need to struggle on. Number two, bitterness erases troubles that we should remember. I went away full, Naomi said. Is that true? Wasn't that such a rose tinted view of the past that had been created by her own bitterness? Wasn't it actually true that she'd had two sickly boys? And that she had left Bethlehem out of fear that her family was going to starve. But bitterness caused her to forget all of that. That she should have remembered. The grass was greener in her memories than it was in reality. Number three, bitterness bleaches the colour out of life. Bitterness has this incredible ability and it's freaky, it's scary, the power that it has. Because not only does it colour in memories that should seem grey, scale, and boring, and dull, and miserable. So like that, you know, she's looking at this past where she had to flee out of home because there's not enough food. But to her, that seems quite pleasant now. So it, it colours in that, but it also bleaches the joy and the colour out of present blessing. God has brought me back empty. I've got nothing, says Naomi. You think how that sounds in Ruth's ears as she's stood beside her? 
Ruth standing in her shadow. She's given up everything to follow Naomi. Who of Bethlehem would kill for a daughter-in-law like this? But the bitter flavour in Naomi's mouth stops her tasting the sweetness. Number four, bitterness robs you of your reason to live. That's how serious bitterness is. See, God made us, we know this, don't we? God made us. People ask that question, what's the meaning of life? And they ask it to you as if nobody knows the answer to that. You know if you're a Christian. That's a great thing. God has made you to bring him glory by enjoying him. We're made for pleasure. We're made for joy. And we're made to find that joy in God. Because he's most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in him. When he's the source of all our happiness. But there's no room in Naomi's life for happiness. The bitterness is so pervasive that she's lost her ability to bless others and lost her ability to bless God. She should be coming back to Bethlehem in joy, shouldn't she? And singing and saying, look where God has returned me to. Here are my people. I'm so glad to see you, fellow brothers and sisters in God. Who, when she returns to Bethlehem, all her words are bitterness, emptiness, calamity. And then when she talks about God, it's El Shaddai, God Almighty. She doesn't talk about His power in saving her from famine doesn't talk about his power in organizing things so this wonderful woman Ruth has come into her life. But she talks about the afflictions from God Almighty and recognizes his power, recognizes his control of all things, but puts a distance between herself and God. He is a God of power, a God of strength, the one who has turned that against her. And so what we look at and what we get here as we look at Naomi's life is a case study in why you need to do everything you can to rid your life of bitterness. Hebrews says this, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. Because that's what bitterness does. It defiles, it twists past and present. And it twists hard and it ruins. And it takes a person who's been saved, a person whose life should be a sacrifice of praise to the King of Kings and robs them of their ability. To be that. Bitterness has got three victims. You. God. And everyone else. Do you think Naomi was an effective evangelist like this? No chance. Her witness is protected. And it's only further testimony to the amazing grace of God... In, in preserving Ruth, that, that she's willing to hang around with this woman. Charles Swindle talks about our hearts being like a house, with a, 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 and bitterness is a, a leaky sewage pipe that's running into the basement. And if it's not quickly repaired, it's only a matter of time before the basement fills up and every rotten secret that we've hidden down there floats to the surface, because bitterness does that. Bitterness in a heart brings up anger and malice and envy and pride. And if something isn't done, if you want, look to Jesus. If you want, repent and call on Him to, to rid you of that bitterness. If you want, confess it openly to God and ask for the help of His Holy Spirit to free you from its grip. It won't be long before the whole house is undermined and sinks. Remember reading it? horrific article about Afghani children who lost their lives and others who lost limbs because they'd be out playing and they'd find a toy, something shiny in the desert. And it was a, a landmine that the Russians had left there. They got a plane. To them it's something fun, it's something safe, something to be enjoyed. And it's a killer. Bitterness is no victimless sin. It's not some twee, unimportant thing in the life of the believer. It is a killer. And, and every time some hard providence, every time some difficult trial comes your way, it's an opportunity for bitterness to strike and to take hold and resentment to, to lay its hands on you. It'll be tempted in those times to dwell on the hard things that have come your way and step by step. Turn your back on God. 
has another way. Bruce Goodrich was going through Army Cadet initiation in the Army Cadets at a, a university in Texas. And these guys were, were obviously put through their paces and forced to go above and beyond the, the physical expectations you'd have for a person. One night they were, they were told to run. They were forced to run until they dropped. But Bruce Goodrich didn't get up again. Never got it. Bruce died. His father wrote a letter to the university, and this is what he wrote. I would like to express the appreciation of my family for the great outpouring of concern and sympathy from the college community over the loss of Bruce. Remember, this is a 19-year-old man. We were deeply touched by the tribute paid to him and particularly pleased to note that his Christian witness did not go unnoticed during his brief time on campus. I hope it will be some comfort to know that we harbour no ill will in this matter. We know our God makes no mistakes. Bruce had an appointment with his Lord and is now secure in his celestial home. And when the question is asked, why did this happen? Perhaps one answer will be, so that many will consider where they will spend eternity. There is a way that is better than bitter. And it's this. Rather than surrender to difficulty, rather than give in to letting suffering make a, a victim of your heart. You fix your eyes on the Lord Jesus. You look to him and his worthiness and the richness of his love towards you. Be struck by his majesty and invest your trials for him. Don't waste your suffering in selfishness. <laughs> oh, this is hard. But don't waste your suffering and selfishness, but turn it into an opportunity to speak for him. Because every single one of you knows how powerful those opportunities are when somebody in suffering speaks for their Savior. Point three, providence. One thing that's really worth noting here is that despite the bitterness... An echo in here. Despite the bitterness, Naomi still believes that God is in control. She calls him El Shaddai, God Almighty. Now that's not much, but it's something. It's not much of a silver lining around this dark cloud of bitterness, but it's something. She might not feel close to God, but she believes that He's in control. And isn't it great to see how honest and real the Bible is in the way that it speaks about the experience of a believer? Because every Christian here can empathize with Naomi. We all know what she's going through. She's having a really hard time and she's become bitter, but she hasn't stopped believing in God. She feels distant from Him. She can't call him my God. She can't call him Jehovah Jireh, my provider. She can't call him Jehovah Shalom, God, my peace. The name Elimelech is always going to stick in her mouth. My God, a king. Have you been in their own shoes? Maybe you're in them tonight. And, and, and you believe that, that God is in control. But he seems so far away. You believe in his power, but you're questioning his love. If that's you, there is one place for you to go. And, and, and with everything I have, press you to go to the cross. You go and read Mark 15. Go and read John 19. Go and see the clearest expression of love for you that has ever been given. Go and see the Lamb of God. Taking away, not just in abstract, the sins of the world, but your sin. Go and look with the eyes of faith that Jesus pinned to the wooden cross and smothered in your sin and wrenched apart from the Father that He loves. 
enduring your wrath, suffering your hell. And then I dare you to ask, as you stand there and look at him, as you think of, of the agony of every breath and the horror of every convulsing muscle, I dare you to ask, do you love me? And you look, and you find that question turn into a statement. You drop the do. You love me more than I ever grasped, more than I dared to think. My Saviour loves me. Friends, this is how wretched the thing bitterness is. This, is. this is why you must do all you can to stay out of its claws. It will even make you forget the love of Jesus for you. But one moment at the foot of his cross, one whisper from the Holy Spirit, it's enough to set a blazing fire in the coldest, most bitter heart. Now if like Naomi you believe that God is in control, even though he seems far away, even though you're wondering, does he love me? If you believe he's in control, then there's hope for you. If you believe that he's El Shaddai, God of unlimited power, then there's hope for you. Because if you believe that he's in control and you believe he has unlimited power, you must believe that he can help you. That's exactly what he did for Naomi. And the little cliffhanger that we're left on as we peer over the precipice of chapter 2. And one that every Jew would understand is the end of verse 2, 22. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. The barley harvest was two weeks. And for two weeks, there was a lot of work for widows to do in Bethlehem. And there was a lot more food around the place than at any other time of year. And then immediately when barley harvest finished, for six to eight weeks followed the wheat harvest. And there was even more work to do and more food around. And if they'd come to Bethlehem at any other time of year, they'd have been much more at risk, much more vulnerable, much more likely to starve. But God Almighty is in control. And he has a purpose for Naomi, the battered Christian, and for Ruth, the baby Christian, and he has a purpose for you. And he's promised to work all things. Even those darkest days. For your good. And his glory. 